Hello and welcome to Mr. Valentin's YouTube video for Romeo and Juliet, Acts 4 and 5. So we're going to begin by going over the plot diagram one last time, and then we'll move through some plot discussion of Act 4, and then plot discussion of Act 5. We're going to begin with the plot diagram. Uh, this is something that you're pretty fully aware of at this point, but reinforcement's always good. So Again, the beginning part of our story is known as the exposition. And again, the exposition is associated with Act 1. All right, and we indicate that with the line at the bottom. The dotted line is what is known as the inciting incident. It's associated with the end of Act 1. The line going up is what we call the complication and it's associated with Act 2. At the very top right here we are associating that with the climax which is Act 3. The line going down is what we call the denouement, and that's associated with Act 4. And at the very bottom bottom, right here. We're associated this with the resolution which is Act 5. So make sure you know the plot diagram. It's fundamental to understanding Shakespeare and understanding any story that we read uh, in class this year. Act 4 Scene 1 begins with Friar Lawrence Paris and Juliet. So we're introduced to all these characters and they're just speaking about events that are occurring, um, they're getting ready for the wedding, and Paris is ecstatic. Paris really does care for Juliet, um, which I think is important to note, because so often Paris is forgotten in this story, uh, and he's a casualty of this story, which is so unfortunate. Um, so he really cares for Juliet. He says to her, happily met my lady and my wife, and Juliet kind of appeases him, and Paris is really looking for some type of attention, some type of love, and so he's waiting for her to say, I love you. Uh, instead, uh, Juliet stays purposely evasive. So Paris says to her, Do not deny to him that you love me. And Juliet says, I will confess to you that I love him. And I think that's an important moment. Right? She says, By saying this, she isn't lying per se, all right? It's just the him that she loves, of course, is Romeo. So as Paris is leaving, he begs for a kiss, and Juliet appeases him. And as Paris leaves, she has a total me meltdown. She says, Oh, shut the door, and when thou hast done so, come weep with me, past hope, past care past help. So she's distraught at the relationship between herself and Paris, uh, and she really just wants to be with Romeo. Uh, she makes a reference to bear baiting, which I think is very important. Bear baiting is a sport back in English times where 
an individual bear would be tied to a stake uh, and would be attacked by three dogs. And so when she referenced herself to a bear, this is line 80 of Act 4, Scene 1, she says, uh, where serpents are chain me with roaring bears. All right, That's the reference that she's making, that she feels like she's tied, that she can't have freedom. Uh, and this is where Friar Lawrence reveals his master plan. He has this long monologue. It starts from line 89, and it goes on um, through line 120. And he talks about this poison. And this poison uh, will allow Juliet to appear dead, even if she actually isn't which will be enough time for her to be buried in the sepulcher and be able to run off with Romeo. And that's her plan. Uh, his plan, I guess. And she goes along with it. She's so excited. She says, give me, give me. All right. Oh, tell not me of fear. So she's very willing to do this. And Friar Lawrence says, Enough, get you gone, hold, get you gone. Be strong and prosperous in this resolve. I'll send a friar with speed to Mantua with my, with my letters to thy lord. So Friar Lawrence is going to send another friar, whose name is Friar John, um, to Mantua, where he will tell Romeo uh, this plan of her appearing to be dead. Act 4, Scene 2 is a very... Very quick scene. Uh, it involves Capulet and the nurse and a serving man, and eventually it'll also include Juliet. And basically, Capulet is extremely excited about the wedding, and so he wants the wedding to occur tomorrow morning. Um, so Capulet moves up the date of the wedding to Wednesday. So you should make note of that. from Thursday. And this becomes important because Friar is sending that letter in the hopes that it gets to Romeo by Wednesday. So if Juliet takes the poison, which she will, then she's taken the poison too early and Romeo will arrive at the wrong time and not be aware that Juliet is simply faking her death. And that ends Act 4, Scene 2. So Act 4, Scene 3 is Juliet speaking with Lady Capulet, and they're just getting ready for their last, her last night as part of the household. And so they leave, and Juliet's left alone on stage. And if a character's left alone on stage is about to reveal private feelings, remember that is what we know as a soliloquy, which is a special type of monologue. And... In her soliloquy, Juliet's contemplating life and death. It starts on line 14 of Act 4, Scene 3, and she says, Farewell. God knows when we shall meet again. And you have to question, who is the we? Is it her own life? Is it Romeo? She says, I have faint, cold fear thrills through my veins that almost freezes up the heat of life. So you get this strong antithetical language, right? So we see some antithesis. And in this antithesis, we see the dichotomy between hot and cold, life and death. And she says, I'll call them back again to comfort me. And so she calls the nurse. And then she pauses and she said, what should she do here? And then she begins to worry. She says, what if this mixture do not work at all? Shall I be married then tomorrow morning? And she decides, no, that can't happen. And she says, this shall forbid it. And she pulls out a knife. So she's willing to kill herself if she has to marry Paris. Then she worries about Friar Lawrence. She says, what if it be a poison which the friar subtly hath ministered to have me dead? So she's concerned that Friar Lawrence 
once her dad. Which is a legitimate concern for her, because, after all, Friar Lawrence is putting his life on the line by going behind the church's back, by having him pretend she's dead. So this is a scary moment for her. So the rest of her is just talking about how horrible this is, how death is about to come to her, and she references like mandrakes, which are like those little screaming onion things, and as she continues this soliloquy, uh, it becomes this kind of exercise in delirium, and she begins to think she sees Tybalt's ghost. Around line 54, she says, A look, methinks I see my cousin ghost seeking out Romeo that did spit his body upon a rapier's point. Stay, Tybalt, stay. And then she pauses for a moment and says, Romeo, 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 here's drink, I drink to thee. And so Juliet drinks the poison. And so that ends the denouement of our story, and we move forward to the resolution. Just kidding. We have Act 4, Scene 4. Sorry about that. Um, and in Act 4, Scene 4, we're going to see um, something different. So, Sorry, I got ahead of myself with the resolution. So, Act 4, Scene 4 is the last scene in the denouement. All right, remember, the denouement is the events leading to the resolution. So, in this final scene, it's somewhat almost comical um, that Capulet and Lady Capulet are speaking at the very beginning, and the nurse, and the nurse goes to wake up Juliet, and she has no idea that Juliet is death, dead. And so she says, line 29 and following, she says, Mistress, what mistress, Juliet? Fast I warned her. Why lamb? Why lady? Fy you slug a bed? Why love? So she's kind of like poking Juliet. And meanwhile, all right, the nurse is unaware that Juliet is dead. Or is, in air quotes, dead. And... She tries waking her up, and she doesn't realize. Um, she's, like, poking her. She's like, I must need wake you, lady, lady, lady. And then she realizes, and this is line 43 and following. She says, alas, alas, help, help, my lady's dead. And so in this moment, the nurse realizes she's dead, and she looks down, and she says, some aqua vitae. Uh, or some aqua vit might be pronounced. And uh, that means like brandy or poison. And so she realizes that Juliet has killed herself. I'll put killed in quotes um, because, again, Juliet's not actually dead. And so the rest of the scene is kind of this morning scene. But what is important is what Capulet says about her death. Um, that she was uh, stolen by death. This is line 65 and following. He says, The night before thy wedding day hath death lain with thy wife. There she lies, flowered as she was, deflowered by him. Death is my son-in-law. So we see some strong personification with death. All right, and as we've said, all right, Juliet is married to death, while Romeo is married to calamity. So we see this reinforced because death, in this instance, is taking her virginity.
So they continue to mourn. What's nice is you see some really strong parallel structure. You see Shakespeare working through his structure. And so it's almost like this kind of dirge, this song that they're lamenting her death, um, which is an important literary term. A dirge is a mournful funeral song in literature. And so notice what Lady, how Lady Capulet, just taking a look at each way they begin their lines. So Lady Capulet begins her lines by saying, Accursed, unhappy, wretchful, wretched, hateful day. And the nurse begins her line by saying, Oh, woe, woeful, woeful, woeful day. And Paris begins his line by saying, Beguiled, divorced, wronged, spited, slain. And Capulet begins his by saying, Despised, distressed, hated, martyred, killed. So they each form this structure, what we call in writing parallel structure. And so in this parallel structure, we really see them mourning and lamenting the death of Juliet. And that's the end of their scene. But after they all leave, Peter and the musicians come out. And what they do is they provide what's known as comedic or comic relief. Comic relief is existing in a story. Uh, usually in Shakespeare, he uses it fairly often to kind of lighten the mood. Uh, especially after very ser serious scenes have occurred. Uh, and this is a very serious scene. So it lightens the mood. It allows the audience to feel like not everything is doom and gloom, despite the story being the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. So again, we know because it's a tragedy that our story is going to end in death. And so now that ends Act 4, and now we move on to the resolution. Act 5, Scene 1, begins with Romeo, and we're introduced to a new character in this moment, and this new character's name is Balthazar. Uh, and Balthazar has news for Romeo, and his news is, is that Julia is dead. So the letter from Friar John... is never received. And so that becomes important because if not, he would know that Julia isn't really dead. And so Romeo immediately starts lamenting. Uh, as Balthazar leaves, he has this soliloquy. And it starts on line 34 and following of Act 5, Scene 1. And he says, well, Juliet, I will lie with thee tonight, meaning he's going to kill himself. Let's see for means. We'll figure out how to do it, how to kill ourselves and or himself. And he goes on to say, oh, mischief, thou art swift to enter in the thoughts of desperate man. So in this instance, we see some strong personification where mischief becomes an actual person that's haunting him. And so he decides a poison will be best. And so in this picture on the right, I have a picture of our apothecary. And this apothecary seems to be very poor. And Romeo knows this. And so he's offering him money. He says, Romeo says to the apothecary, line 58 and following, Come hither, man. I see that thou art poor. Hold, there is forty ducats. Uh, and ducats are like gold coins. Uh, and he asks him for a fatal drug. And the apothecary says, such mortal drugs I have, but Mantua's law is death. All right. So initially, all right, the apothecary does not want to give the concoction, the poison.
So we see that, and Romeo says, Art thou so bare and full of wretchedness, and fair as to die? All right. Contempt and bang beggary hangs upon thy back. All right, that it's as if something is breathing down his neck um, and is waiting for him. And the apothecary finally agrees. He says, my poverty, but not my will, consents. All right, which I think is a very strong mo moment for the apothecary. So the apothecary only agrees to give him this poison because he is poor. And the apothecary says, it will dispatch you straight, meaning it will kill him instantly. And so that ends Act 5, Scene 1. Act 5, Scene 2 is simply Friar John and Friar Lawrence speaking, uh, and Friar Lawrence saying that he did not deliver the letter, that the letter was never received. And Friar Lawrence is concerned. He has a little mini soliloquy at the end of the scene uh, around lines 23 and following saying that now must I to the monument alone, that he has to go to the sepulcher where he will see Julia and hopefully be able to bump into Romeo there. The final scene in the play uh, involves Paris and Romeo initially. Juliet would be laid out already, dead, on stage. And Romeo is talking with Balthazar, and Paris sees Romeo, and he says, line 49 and following, This is thy banished haughty Montague that murdered my love's cousin. With which grief it is supposed the fair creature died, and here is come to do such some villainish shame to the dead bodies. So... Paris thinks that Romeo's there because he wants to, like, vandalize the area or do something perverse with the bodies. Uh, and they begin to talk, and immediately they fight. And what inevitably happens is Romeo kills Paris. What's odd about this is that Paris has kind of gotten a bum rap that he really loved Juliet and in this moment it's kind of all being taken away. So he has a dying wish. He says, open the tomb, lay me with Juliet. And I think the shocking part of it all is Romeo says, in faith I will, that he is going to lay Paris with Juliet, because it was his dying wish. And I think it's in this moment that Romeo realizes that love is fleeting, death is lurking everywhere, that this was all a mistake. So he looks at Juliet, and again we see that strong personification of death. And in this personification of death, Romeo says, and this is line 91 and following, Call this a lightning, O oh my love, my wife, death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath, hath had no power yet upon thy beauty, thou art not conquered. So we hear that death has stolen her breath away. All right? And he goes on to say, and death's pale flag is not advanced there. And... He mourns, he laments, he kisses Juliet in a moment of passion. and She's dead, or at least he thinks he's dead. Um, and so he drinks the poison, and he dies. He says, thy drugs are quick, thus with a kiss I die. So in this moment, we're seeing strong, dramatic irony, because we as the audience know that Juliet's not dead and that his death is frivolous. And remember, dramatic irony is when the audience knows more than the characters. So just keep that in mind. So Romeo's dead, Juliet is fake dead at this point. Friar Lawrence enters the scene. Some time has gone by, even though it all happens instantaneously. Uh, 
Friar Lawrence says that 30 minutes have passed. And he comes in and he sees the dead bodies, especially Romeo's dead body just strewn right there. And he says, alack, alack, what blood is this which stains the stony entrance of the sepulchre? All right. And as he's speaking, Juliet starts to wake. And Juliet says, oh, comfortable friar, where is my lord? And then she looks around and she sees her dead Romeo. Friar Lawrence, during this time, says, I hear some noise, and he runs away. He abandons her. Um, Friar Lawrence probably at this moment is scared that some police or someone is going to run and find out what was occurring down here. And if he's caught, he knows he'll be in trouble. So he flees. He says, I dare no longer stay. Uh, and he tries to tell Juliet, come, go, go, good Juliet. So he tries to get her to leave, but he runs away to save himself. So Juliet looks at Romeo, and she doesn't know what to do and realizes he's poisoned himself. So she does the, tries to anyway, kiss him and steal some of the poison off his lips, but it doesn't work. Then when she hears people entering the sepulcher, she takes his dagger and stabs herself, saying, Oh, happy dagger. Um, so you see a little personification in the dagger that it's happy. She says, This is thy sheath. There rust and let me die. And she stabs herself. So, again, strong personification. So at this point, Romeo has taken poison. Good. Romeo, NASA poison. Romeo has taken poison and killed himself. And then Juliet stabs herself. And so we're left with a scene of just dead bodies kind of strewn about everywhere. It's, it's pretty horrific. So the Watchmans come in, they see all the dead bodies, and enters everyone else. The Prince, Capulet, Lady Capulet. Um, and they're confused. Montague enters, and they're not sure how it happens. And so Friar Lawrence actually returns, uh, and he confesses. Which I think is an important moment, uh, that he comes clean about what happened, and explains what occurred. And so he goes in, scene by scene, explaining about the fake poison, about um, him sending letters to Mantua, everything. Uh, and that's kind of that. Um, so it feels very plot summary-ish. Uh, so that's a good, good monologue to read if you want to know exactly what happened in the story. And in this moment, the prince is looking about, and he takes blame. He says, Capulet Montague, see what a scourge is laid upon your hate, the f that heaven finds means to kill your joys with love, and I for winking at your discords, that he didn't try to make a truce. So, in this moment, the prince takes partial blame in the death of all these young people. Which I think is important because he should have maybe, just maybe, tried to get some type of truce, some type of honor to occur in this scene. So, um, and throughout the story. And this is where the story takes kind of a dark turn, if it wasn't dark already, with three dead bodies kind of hanging out. Um, line 295 and following, Capulet says, Ooh, I forgot one last important little bit before we get to the very end. Um, Montague is in mourning, not just for Romeo's death. We find out that Lady Montague died of grief. That's a teeny bit. It's such a throwaway, one quick thing that happens. Almost forgot. All right, but Lady Montague died of grief. Um, uh, she doesn't even know that Romeo's dead. She uh, just died once he was banished. She didn't know what to do. Which is also kind of interesting because we don't really see too much of Lady Montague in our story. In fact, Romeo's interactions with his family is pretty much non-existent. We only see Juliet's interaction with her family, uh, where she's either talking to her mother or getting slapped around by her father. So, fast-forwarding. 
Capulet says at the end with Montague, he says, Oh, brother, Montague, give me thy hand. This is my daughter's jointure, for no more can I demand. All right? So, like, there's going to be money involved. And Montague tries to one-up him. He says, But I can give thee more, for I will raise her statue in pure gold. So, Montague... wants to raise a statue of pure gold of Juliet. Which might seem like this really honorable thing, and we could totally view it as such. But you might also want to question if that's necessary, if that's correct. Um, it seems like they're replacing life with gold. Uh, it's a really disturbing moment of materialism, if this is our ending scene, have they learned anything? And I would argue, maybe they haven't. So there's a theme of materialism in the story. We see it with, even at the end, Romeo with the apothecary, kind of playing on his unfortunate soul, having no money. So that's an, a sad kind of end note. And the prince says... In his final, he closes the, the play, he says, A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show his head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. Some shall be pardoned, and some punished. For never was a story of mo more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. Now, that kind of closes things, but... It says some shall be pardoned and some punished. Now, if you have the Degani Shakespeare, it says on page 326, remember that Romeo and Juliet is not Shakespeare's original story. Right? This is based on another story known as the tragical history of Romeo and Juliet. And so the people who are pardoned and punished in that story are made clear. Uh, it says in the Degani's text, leaves... Uh, so this source leaves no ambiguity about who is pardoned and who is punished. All right. The friar is pardoned, Friar Lawrence, which is kind of weird because he seems like the person who's caused the most trouble. All right. The people who are punished is, of course, all right, the nurse. She's banished in that story. And someone is hanged, and that person is the apothecary. Which almost seems unfair, because the apothecary didn't even want to donate the money, and the nurse was just a bystander. So, what we see again is this theme of materialism. Think of the friar. Who is the friar? He's a holy man, he's a good-natured man. The nurse and the apothecary are both lower-class people. So this theme of materialism shines through even in the, the suggestion of some shall be pardoned and some shall be punished. And so that brings us to the end of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, always important to note, all of my pictures are copyright of Cambridge Press. All of my great pictures. Um, and I suggest also, if you like the pictures and are interested in reading, another good edition is the iPad app for the Romeo and Juliet. Uh, they have some really good translations in there. And so that's that. So if there's any questions, feel free to contact me if you're watching this and you're not part of my school. Uh, feel free to drop me likes or comments or anything of the sort. Um, and uh, look forward to my next set of podcasts. Be sure if you like Shakespeare, I have a great Macbeth set of podcasts and they're also available on my channel. Thanks very much.